So today we have a, a real treat. We get to talk to Nathan Servan, who's a professor at the University of Alberta and, of course, the previous director of AMI. Thank you for coming to join us today. Thank you. So I'm really interested in how people get into AI research. What's their journey like? How did you end up working on AI? When I was a little kid, I remember reading, there was this article that was in the newspaper and it was trying to explain why AI was a hard problem. And this is probably back in the 80s or something like that. And it just said, well, we can't describe the system to itself. And I asked my mom, I said, well, why can't you describe like a fraction of the system and then say the whole thing is the same? Yeah, I have no idea like what that article was talking about, who was saying these things, what they were trying to do. But that's probably my earliest memory of talking and thinking about AI. As a family, we always played lots of games. And so at the time, uh, Deep Blue was like in Kasparov were having their matches. And so there was just a lot of there that's, that really captured my attention. And I was thinking about things like card games. How do you play card games properly? That sort of opened up those opportunities. And then as I started looking at grad school, um, I didn't really think that I could ever come to Canada um, at the time. I grew up near LA. And so UCLA was there. Rich Corp was working on uh, the Rubik's Cube at the time. And so there were just, that opened up sort of some doors to go in that direction. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we have kind of a similar journey where we started somewhere else and then we came to the U of A to study and then we left for a while and came back. And in fact, mm -hmm. of course, you remember my first ever paper in machine learning was with you. Yeah. Um, do you remember what that paper was about? <laughs> of course, it was on the game of hearts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I built as part of my PhD thesis, a program to play hearts and given enough computational resources could play reasonably well. I came up to the U of A and Rich Sutton was doing reinforcement learning. And it's something that I had like learned a little bit about, but hadn't, didn't have a lot of experience with. So I'm like, well, I really should try and see what happens if we throw some of this reinforcement learning stuff on top of what we have. And so I, I learned a lot from that. And, uh, you know, we built a much better program using reinforcement learning on that project. Yeah, I remember from my side, because I came to Rich, it's like, well, maybe it'd be fun to use reinforcement learning on, on a game. He's like, I know the person and he just got up and then took me to your office. So it was, it was kind of funny experience for me. You work a lot in search and of course in, in machine learning, how, how do you see those two fields interacting, especially probably going forward? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because if you look at search historically, so go back to like Rich Korf's work. So in 1985, he invented IDA star, and then he was the first to solve random Rubik's cubes instances uh, optimally. And if you look at that, that whole line of work was based on, we're going to build heuristics with like really certain properties. And then we're going to build algorithms that take advantage of those properties. And we're going to put those together and we're going to really be able to, you know, understand what's going on. We'll build this big framework on like on what's going there. Uh, and so like that was very successful up into a point. Um, and then you think about like, there's a lot of assumptions there that maybe don't hold in real world problems. And so I was always a little bit worried, right? What's going to happen when, you know, you've got this maybe community of people who are basing things on these assumptions, when maybe some other communities come along and they're doing things differently and they're going to start thinking about things differently. Um, so I've been interested in that question, like how is that going to impact the, the field of search? And there's a lot of different ways that it does. But I think there's sort of two things that we can do and they're both valid and they're both useful to understand. Is One is we can ask hey, machine learning is this powerful tool that we have, um, you know, given recent advancements or hardware and other things like this. Can we get machine learning to actually fit into the mold that we've expected from these previous algorithms? Mm -hmm. So that's like, can I use machine learning to learn an admissible heuristic? Right. Um, and so we've been able to do that successfully. The other question is, hey, can we take our algorithms and can we adapt our algorithms to deal with what happens in machine learning? So as an example, the uh, IDA star algorithm that's often used um, doesn't work well with like a real valued heuristic. Um, you, your iterations grow too slowly. You have this N squared overhead. And so there was a, a paper that came out of our department a few years ago that uh, looked at like, how you could redesign IDA star and you could get that worst case to go from N squared to N log C star, where C star is the optimal solution quality. But the idea is that we're actually trying to now adapt the algorithm to be able to handle a different type of data. So there's, I think, questions to be asked on both sides. Yeah, and of course, the other thing that's very top of mind for, for many AI researchers right now is, you know, these large language models and how mm -hmm. do they fit into to research? We're thinking about it in, in reinforcement learning. What, what are your thoughts about it in, in terms of your area? They encapsulate something. Yeah. 
but exactly what they encapsulate, you know, people are still figuring that out. So I think there's a couple of different answers. Um, maybe I'll go with the easier answer, <laughs> which is actually goes into the area of, of looking at game playing. And what uh, one of my uh, former students was looking at is that when we think about a game, like a sequence of playing a game, like a card game, so going back to something like Hearts, and what he what he's able to do is he basically was able to say, let's treat the gameplay as a language, and let's learn it with something like a large language model or um, ad adapt one, and then on top of that, we can deal with some of the issues of like the information I don't know about other players, mm -hmm. and and so you can build like a search on top of this language that's being that's been learned and can be expressed. So I think there's some really interesting things of like trying to use that as a heuristic or using as guidance to capture some information that like may not be observable about the world, you know, using that then as a tool, even if it's not perfect, but it's like, it gives us some guidance. And and just in terms of popularity of research, are you seeing in the, in the games community, like a big push towards LLMs or, or is it at the aid conference? They're looking at, can I use LLMs to generate puzzles? And so like uh, New York times connections, puzzles, and you see a lot of things like that. What can we do? And actually some interesting work of like, how can I generate and then maybe correct what's being generated. So trying to get these mixes of, of different things together. I don't think it's going to give us general AI, but I think maybe it's another tool in our toolbox that we're going to learn how to use effectively. And we're going to learn the type of problems that maybe look like language and therefore they can model them a little bit informally, but model them in a way that might be uh, much more efficient and make, capture some things that are hard to capture in traditional methods. Right. And so mentioning the the aid conference, you have recently won multiple awards uh, yeah. at that conference. Maybe you can first tell us a little bit about the conference and then tell us about your multiple award-winning work. <laughs> Thank you. Aid is uh, artificial intelligence and interactive digital entertainment. And so this conference has been around for quite a few years now. Um, I was a chair at one point, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like this. And so it's focused on you know the games industry and, uh, and AI and asking how they can work together. We had a couple of awards that we got. Um, one of them is a follow-up work on uh, work with a student that we co-supervised, Eugene Chen. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I think I need to tell a little bit of background. So cool. a little more than 10 years ago, I was looking at sort of the computational power that we have in our computers and was thinking about like how we can leverage that. So if you look at procedural content generation at the time, this idea is we want to create content to go into games. Um, a lot of the, that was like, I'm going to generate sort of a bespoke generator. And we could think about like, well, what is the expressivity of that generator and questions like this, which were interesting questions. But there were some situations where I looked at it, I'm like, I really think that, you know, there's only like a trillion things you can do here, or maybe even a billion things that you can do. And we can pretty easily go through and generate a billion items of content, mm -hmm. or we might be able to cut some of that out and uh, prove that it's worse than the other content. So these spaces aren't always really, really big. So I started this sort of it was sort of like a side project, sort of like a hobby for the first couple of years where I started building these systems. And part of it was just trying to understand like, hey, for existing games, like, is it there's only one game or two games? Or is this something that's really broad that this might be an interesting tool? So we started looking at what I now call exhaustive procedural content generation. And we were asking, what are the like realms in which I can, instead of trying to build a bespoke generator, I can just iterate through all the content. So we illustrated that you could do this in a bunch of games, or we could do it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but if I can do that, then the question changes. It doesn't become like, how do I build my generator? The question becomes, how do I choose interesting content? Because now I've got it all sitting in right. front of me. So now I have to ask, like, what is interesting content that I want to give to users? I need to be able to evaluate content. And so this is the work we were doing, uh, beginning with Eugene and then with Junwen, who's my uh, current student. He's continuing. Junwen Shen is continuing into a PhD with me. Awesome. And what we looked at is we said, maybe we can use some of um, like information theory to talk about like how much information is in a puzzle. So we can talk about like what does a someone who's working with a puzzle know? What do they not know? And we can measure like how much information would it take, for instance, to communicate to you uh, the final version was like, I want to communicate. You've got like a policy that you're going to try and use to solve this puzzle. And I want to communicate to you what it takes to get that policy to shift to a policy that's always guaranteed to solve the puzzle. Mm. 
And uh, so Junlin worked this out. He found this actually really interesting connection between that and just the probability of solving the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And uh, ends up that there's a, there's a relationship there from the information and the probability. Probabilities are a little bit hard to work with. Con converting to information is a little bit easier for us humans to parse, but they're somewhat equivalent. And so he showed how to do this, and we were able to show that like, we could evaluate this, we could look at machine learning policies, we could evaluate what they've learned, right. and it sort of opened up a number of doors to really try and understand what's going on there. So that was one. Yep. Um, the second thing we were looking at then is this puzzle that I got, and it was sort of a boring puzzle. <laughs> Um, you could put together the pieces. You So it's a tangram puzzle. We were trying to put pieces into a board and make them fit. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, there's all these opportunities to make the design sort of be much, much more interesting. Then I was thinking about, you know, well, we've been doing this work on exhaustive generation. Maybe we could exhaustively generate like and answer a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. And then and then I was playing around with some 3D printing. So we started 3D printing um, these boards and these pieces. And so we started to say like, what are all the ways that I can put pieces together? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look at all the combinations of like, if I choose these sets of pieces, how many solutions will there be? And then I can start to put constraints. Like if I put two pieces down, maybe I have two pieces of the same color. So those pieces maybe have to be next to each other or maybe they can't be next to each other. We could try to really create a rich curriculum which uh, my student went ahead and did. So he created this little booklet where you could then like have this curriculum that um, gives you some puzzles and then tried to think about how we use actually this, the work that Junlin was doing on entropy to, or information to say, how do we now create something where there's like more and more information that's going to scaffold you up to learning these puzzles. So that one best poster paper and then the best, best demo, because we had a bunch of these printed out that everybody could uh, come play with at the conference. That's really cool. Like in the olden days when people would submit papers at conferences, they'd print out their paper <laughs> and then put it in an envelope and mail it. Yeah. But you would, could have included that puzzle <laughs> to the reviewers. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting when, when someone works in, in games like you because the, the question of like, well, how is your research, you know, applicable in the real world? There's an answer there, right? Like you were already talking with some cases for procedural content generation and stuff like that. But maybe outside of, of the video game world or, or like the puzzle world, is there interesting or unexpected applications of games research that people wouldn't think of? So one thing that I'm immediately seeing is that as we're trying to look at the next steps for this work, what we saw in the work we had at aid was that the question then becomes actually, how do you model the player? Because now we know, like, given a model, we can start to show, like, what's harder, what's easier, and it matches up with the data sets we've, that we have available. But we saw that, like, on different puzzles, it really depends your model of your player. Right, right. And so now we're thinking about, like, player modeling. And what we're really seeing right now is doing some literature searches and working with students. There's a lot of other data sets that are uh, looking at learning and looking at, for instance, like math curricula and things like this. Mm -hmm. So there's a big connection there. And I don't know exactly, like it's hard to predict at this point, but we're like sitting on the edge of that body of literature. Right. And I've been reading some of the recent papers. And so, you know, I don't know how this is going to fit together exactly, but um, either we're going to leverage that work into what we're doing, or we're yeah. going to leverage what we're doing into that work. And I'm sort of excited to see what's going to come out of that. Yeah, th there's a potential beautiful synergy there because of course, with pressure on funding and education, automated tutoring systems seems like a really big thing. LLMs are also relevant for that question as well. So that'd be that would be really amazing if we could actually move towards a world where, you know, individual students get specialized tutoring that, that they absolutely need and they're not getting in these giant classroom settings. So that's that's really beautiful. Thank you very much for joining us today, Nathan. That that was a wonderful conversation and it's it's always a joy to talk to you.